Hey guys, thanks for coming out. Um, today we've got uh, another author talk here at Google. Um, Alexa Clay is a leading expert on subculture and innovation from unlikely places. She's the co-author of The Misfit Economy, a book that explores underground and informal information. She works to create bridges and opportunities for misfit subcultures within the formal economy. She's the founder of Wisdom Hackers, an incubator for philosophical inquiry and the co-founder of the League of Entrepreneurs, a movement to create change from within incumbent systems and big organizations. Alexa's written and appeared in Fast Company, Forbes, Wired, Dazed and Confused, Vice, Harvard Business Review, The New York Times, and MTV. Please give me a hand in welcoming Alexa Clay. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thanks, Google, for having me. How are you guys doing? Excellent. Uh, so I want to share really three passions with you today. Uh, the first, misfits. For the past three years, I've been traveling around the world and speaking to pirates and hackers and gangsters and really trying to, to better understand a different face of entrepreneurship. I think when we, when we often think of the personality of the entrepreneur, it's sort of the, the geek wonder kind, uh, you know, the Mark Zuckerberg or you know, hoodie wearing college dropout. And I wanted to really expand that definition and look at people that we don't think of but are often entrepreneurs in the informal and black market economies. So I'll share a little bit about that and uh, from my new book, The Misfit Economy. And then I want to talk about alter egos. I've been experimenting with alter egos now for a few years. And uh, it's a passion I have that I hope you'll leave today also uh, wanting to experience some of. But my appreciation for alter egos really started uh, when I had to increasingly commodi commodify myself for this talking head type culture. And you know, through Facebook, through Twitter, through you know, developing this LinkedIn persona, increasingly individuals are becoming brands. And to escape some of that pressure, I started developing um, people who were not me, who I could begin to, to play with to escape the Alexa Clay that was becoming everywhere on the internet. So I'll talk a little bit about some of those experiments and then lastly, I want to share a new project that I'm working uh, on that looks at this idea of uh, basically an incubator for the next Messiah and really explores how our spiritual and prophetic traditions are, gonna, are being shaped by the digital age. So let's get started. My real love and appreciation for misfits to some extent started with this desire to look at people who didn't operate within traditional command and control capitalism. So for me personally, I grew up in uh, with two parents who are anthropologists. I love Joan of Arc and Henry Thoreau, two famous misfits when I was younger. Um, and my mother actually researched alien abduction while I was growing up. So she traveled the world and spoke to people who believed they were somehow abducted by aliens. And I think in some way, this gave me a real appreciation for talking to people uh, who made me deeply uncomfortable, as well as preserving unknowns, you know, not trying to come out pro or con on whether or not I thought aliens existed, but appreciating that conversation. Um, I remember when I was eight years old, feeling like uh, both sort of terrified, you know, as you're beginning to distinguish between fantasy and reality as a child, the existence of aliens or the possible existence of aliens was, was deeply unsettling and destabilizing. But then I also remember, in addition to fear, feeling this sense of um, really of, of loss at not being chosen as an ambassador of the human race. Like, why wasn't I being abducted if these aliens were really out there? Um, and so going from this experience of you know, abduction and alien encounters, I started uh, going into a very different terrain. I'd always had a more esoteric upbringing. And I went into the corporate heart of darkness. I went into Fortune 500 and multinational companies. And within those environments, I really wanted to understand them with an anthropological eye. You know, what are the, what are the rituals? What, are, what does it mean to sort of put on that office suit and play that game? Um, and how are some of the, these bureaucracies functioning? And within those environments, I discovered what you know, appeared to me like a lost tribe of corporate rebels. We called them entrepreneurs or people that were actively trying to hack these cultures from within. Um, so someone, for example, like Dave Burdish, who I met, who was at Ford Motor Company. 
And he essentially uh, was a third generation auto worker. His grandfather had been um, a prominent activist who worked at Ford. He'd been beaten by Ford's henchmen. So he had this sort of love-hate relationship with Ford. And Dave is someone that very much tried to become an adopter radical activist type of perspective within the company. So he got the company to think more about human rights. Oh, yay. OK. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit then. Uh, so here, corporate rebels. So Dave was someone who got the company to think a lot more about human rights practices. Uh, he was trying to get the company to build out mobility solutions. So to think beyond just automobile manufacturing, how do we actually create um, you know, social and environmental business models within this company? How do we begin to hack you know, the DNA of this old dinosaur and get it to become a little bit more future friendly. So I met tons of people like this. We started essentially what was like Alcoholics Anonymous type uh, therapy groups for them. So we brought all these corporate rebels that we could find from, um, you know, Morgan Stanley, from Ford, from Unilever, from all these different companies and brought them together to have a space where they could uh, peer mentor each other. And uh, from that was, was created the, the League of Intrapreneurs, which basically provided that a, a global guerrilla movement for connecting intrapreneurs from across these companies to work together. And from there, I got really interested in working with people that weren't just camouflaging within the system. I think intrapreneurs really have to, to hide some of their bigger agenda to actually make it fit with corporate priorities and figure out how to game corporate systems. And so I wanted to really work with people that were more guerrilla agents on the outside of our systems, working with people in the black market and informal economies. One law made, hundred laws made to break it. Great, so you can see there in the video some of the different archetypes that we focused on within the book. Um, and really the, the start of this all began with seeing the ways in which a lot of these illegal economies actually predated innovations within the mainstream economy. So for example, McDonald's. Before McDonald's invented the franchising structure, you actually had the mafia and groups like Hells Angels that were using this. Um, this structure that predated ways in which corporations were using it today. Or looking, for example, within the porn industry. I think, you know, thinking beyond Hulu or YouTube or Netflix, it was that video streaming technology was first used uh, really within the porn sector. And then, for me, the real epiphany for a lot of this work began when I started meeting people that used to run drug businesses. So one of the first conversations I had was with a guy who uh, made over sort of $8,000 a week running a heroin business. And 
he was an amazing entrepreneur. I came to see that even though he was on the wrong side of the law in a lot of ways, he was you know, managing a product, building a brand, um, you know, doing customer recruitment, retaining employees. He did all the things that any traditional entrepreneur would do. And yet, um, he ended up going to prison. And in getting out of prison, he didn't have many opportunities for employment. And so he got connected with a program called Defy Ventures. And the purpose of Defy Ventures is basically to bridge these worlds of formal entrepreneurship and the traditional venture capital community with uh, the world of prisons and ex-cons and people that do have these amazing uh, entrepreneurial leadership skills but need to plug in to formal entrepreneurship. And so Defy Ventures runs what is a bit of an incubator or accelerator for people to, uh, to pitch and grow their skills within the formal economy. And another conversation that I had really early on was with someone called King Tone. And he was the former leader of the Latin Kings, a Hispanic street gang. And they just undergone in the late 90s one of their deadliest periods uh, where the gang had done this internal purging and they were really being penetrated by the FBI and at risk of losing their you know, license to operate in a lot of ways. And Tone was someone who really was thinking about how to do change management from within this gang culture. He wanted to ask, what if we take this gang and transition it more into a social movement like the Black Panthers? And so he built group uh, alliances with activist groups and really tried to upskill the gang to develop some of these skills to become uh, to become more of a civic actor rather than just being dependent on the criminal economy. And he encountered a lot of, a lot of challenge there. You know, there were many people that didn't want to see the Latin Kings evolve. There were many people, too, whose incomes depended on the illicit economy. And even within the gang, there were so many people who didn't want to, to lose the stealthy nature of the gang. They didn't want to come out and be more publicly visible um, as a force for good in the world because you know, they were deeply threatened by, by uh, a lot of the traditional power systems and, and by having a public brand. You know, this was a brand that had always stayed in the shadows. So he's someone that I've continued to talk to and really focus on how we can build better um, you know, risk-taking and decision-making skills for youth, but he also completely changed my mindset about gang cultures um, in the US. And he's now working on a memoir project to help document some of his stories from within the Latin Kings. The, another person um, in a similar vein of you know, how do we use people that were formerly within these black market or illicit economies and plug them into the formal economy. Uh, Chris and I were chatting a little bit about moonshine, which I've developed a newfound appreciation for. Um, and we've been taking moonshine around to a bunch of our launch events. Uh, how many of you guys have tried moonshine before? Yeah? OK. Where are you from, like Appalachia? Or you've just, it's like a new hipster phenomenon. OK, cool. They make their own? No, no. OK, nice. Yeah, so it's fantastic. We, it's, it's, um, we made moonshine cocktails at one of our launches. And it was just, um, it's really a forceful drink. But to me, it's interesting because in Tennessee now, it's legalized. So after the financial crisis there, the state decided to legalize uh, the production of moonshine. And so now there are all these companies that are emerging that are actually working with old school bootleggers. So people that have been doing this and it's been passed on as a sort of artisanal craft for generations. And so the founder of Sugarlands, for example, is working with all these old bootleggers. And he told me the, you know, at their first meeting, he met with a guy who was drinking moonshine out of a bear claw. And so you just have this really interesting bridge between these informal cultures on the one hand and these new companies that are trying to, to package this and provide economic opportunity for people that have been formerly in the illicit economy. And camel milk. Camel milk is another thing that I have been evangelizing and forcing people to try. We profile camel milk in the book a bit, looking at the ways in which Amish camel milk farmers around the US are distributing camel milk. It's now a product that's available in Whole Foods and here in California, for example. And it's essentially being sold to get around FDA regulations um, through buyer's clubs, buyer's clubs that are similar to the ones that were created in the 80s to sell HIV AIDS medications. So it's, it's mostly th sold through membership associations like that. And there are a huge group of lobbyists or activists now who are working on trying to legalize camel milk within the US. 
copycats. They're traveling to India and China and Brazil uh, for this research, I met a lot of people that really didn't care a whole lot about intellectual property. They basically were fine to infringe on corporate patents. And so, for example, in India, I spoke to someone who was essentially reverse engineering pharmaceutical drugs and making them much more accessible and affordable for the poor there. And this became a really interesting strategy. And the more that I researched this, the more that I came to see the ways in which Western pharmaceutical companies, in response to the pressure of copycat imitators in a lot of these markets, actually had to develop tiered pricing models to compete. So in this way, the sort of the copycats who were questioning the monopolistic practices of a lot of these companies forced uh, these Western companies ultimately to evolve. And I think it's a bit ironic because certainly in the US, a lot of the founding of the US industrial economy was built on patent robbers who stole patents from Western Europe and commercialized them here in the US with completely infringing on it. And yet it's, it's now companies, um, mostly US companies who are abroad who are trying to protect their IP in a similar way. And going to another historic culture, um, part of the, the premise of this book was to say, well, what can we learn from these alternative economies to actually reprogram the mainstream economy? And so we did a lot of re research into self-governance, into different ways of organizing. And it became really interesting, in fact, to study historic pirate cultures and to see ways in, ways in which pirates organize their vessels. And a lot of historic pirates were actually escaping the the dehumanizing conditions of merchant vessels. And so they created egalitarian societies aboard their ships. Uh, they actually created constitutions to govern their vessels before constitutions were created by Western Europe, European uh, nations. And they had more egalitarian pay systems than the merchant vessels. And similarly, Anonymous was another organization, um, and a lot of hacker collectives actually that we studied were really interesting in pioneering decentralized forms of leaderlessness. You also saw this in the Occupy movement. So we really came to understand ways in which um, cultures and corporate cultures could actually leverage principles from decentralized uh, governance and leaderlessness. You know, there's not one, any one person within Anonymous that is uh, the spokesperson or that is controlling um, the actions that are, untaken, that are undertaken by the group. Anyone can submit to take an action under Anonymous and then other people that want to um, go in on that action are welcome. And so that became really another way of thinking about inspiring examples of cultures that were more self-governing. And, and now you do see corporate cultures that are beginning to experiment more with this. And then another element that we really looked at was this idea of the hacker ethos, not merely anonymous and IT hackers, but the ways in which the hacker ethos was spilling over into mainstream culture. And one of my uh, conversations that just let, left me totally buzzing was with this, this guy, Gary Slutkin, who basically went around to try and hack the problem of violence. So he, he, in a lot of ways, was more of a late blooming misfit, a reluctant hacker, but he started off as a researcher in infectious disease. And he did work on tuberculosis and malaria and HIV AIDS in Africa for years. He burnt out. He ended up going back to his native Chicago. And there in Chicago, started reading the newspaper and, and reading all of these incidents of violence and urban and inner city gangs and all the issues there. And so started studying these patterns of violent outbreak and recognizing that violence spreads exactly the same way that an infectious disease spreads. And so from this insight, he went about trying to cure the world of violence in the same way that you would go about curing or containing an infectious disease. So he created a network of violence interrupters, people that um, could be called in to mediate instances of, of where violence might, might erupt or might occur. And in many neighborhoods where you don't necessarily feel comfortable calling in your local police force, calling in this you know, trusted intermediary who you know, isn't going to you know, put the law on you was safer for a lot of these communities. And a lot of the violence interrupters, similar to the community health outreach model, are actually from these communities. So they have much more trust. Uh, from there, I've been doing a lot of research on another kind of alternative community, which are you know, the role of LARPing. I don't know how many people have ever LARPed before. Um, one, <laughs> you're Google. Two, you've done everything. You like drink moonshine and LARP. 
Um, so I'm doing my first LARP in a few weeks, but I, I think this genre is especially interesting for testing out alternative scenarios, and particularly the Nordic LARP scene really allows you to prototype alternative worlds. So if you have a question about, you know, if you're building an alternative financial system or you're really interested in living in a communitarian society, rather than fully commit to that, you can actually just spend three hours exploring what that world would look like. Um, and in many ways, I think LARP as, is an interesting phenomenon too because you have to inhabit these alternative identities. And so that touches a bit on my love for alter egos and seeing, you know, as you begin to inhabit these different personalities, there's this phenomenon of bleeding where some of the, the characteristics of the character that you're playing come to bleed into your normal personality. And in many ways, sometimes that can be destabilizing, other times it can be deeply therapeutic as you come to test, uh, you know, out different personality traits. I was interviewing someone the other day who told me he learned how to be an extrovert through LARP. And so going through all these different case studies, we essentially uh, synthesized five key principles that were really part of these misfit economies that we think can be applied to more formal systems that are in need of change and provocation. And so um, certainly this idea of hustle is really important. It's something that we see tying the, the black market communities um, of drug dealers, of gangsters with the startup and tech communities. Uh, the next is really looking at that hacker ethos and how that is not just functioning um, within those IT communities, but spilling over and becoming, um, you know, people, even entrepreneurs who are trying to hack corporate cultures from the inside or people that are trying to hack uh, vital societal problems. Looking at the power of copy copycat behavior and what happens when people actually start collaborating and putting less of a premium on intellectual property. Uh, looking at, you know, with LARP or with some of the more provocative artistic protagonists that we profiled in the book, looking at the power of provocation. Um, definitely you see this a lot in activist groups too, but how do we ask the questions that not only get us to think about different business models, but get us to really question entire systems. So we did a lot of interviews, for example, with protagonists within the unschooling system and looking at people that were even questioning the entire construct of how we do traditional education. And then lastly, uh, you have maybe heard a lot about you know, pivots and lean startups. And so for us, we really looked at pivots as a different phenomenon, pivots as uh, personal pivots. So many of the misfits that we spoke to were incredible in the sense that they were able to, you know, walk the road less chosen. They were able to take these dramatic leaps and go into new fields and tolerate a great degree of ambiguity and take risks. And so we focus a lot on these stories of people that got, you know, truly got out of their comfort zones and were able to bring, you know, diverse worlds, worlds together to accomplish some of their entrepreneurial ventures. And as a result, we have The Misfit Economy, the book in front of you. We also did a spin-out show on Nat Geo called Underworld Inc., which ran for a time. We had a Kickstarter campaign initially where we raised over $17,000 that got us started. And we've worked with both traditional media, but then we've also done a few quirky things. So uh, we, ha we worked to get um, Nigerian spam sent out around the time of our book launch where we did develop these fake spam notes. I don't know if you can see these from here. Um, and sent these to all of our friends. And um, that was enormously fun, and a lot of people didn't realize that it was fake. And then we also grew, um, tagged the city. So we did a bunch of graffiti around New York City, and, and we also tagged it with stickers. And then we had a launch party where we brought a bunch of uh, drug kingpins and, and sort of big mavericks within the black market economy together. So we had, in the middle there is George Young, who inspired Johnny Depp's performance in the movie Blow. Um, we also have Antonio Fernandez, who I mentioned earlier, who was the leader of the Latin Kings, and David Victorson, who uh, smuggled 37 tons of cocaine from Col of, of marijuana, sorry, from Colombia to uh, Seattle, Washington. And they, it, this was an interesting event because on the one hand, we brought together all these leaders who are amazing entrepreneurs in the black market economy, and then we brought them in conversation with the tech scene and startup founders in New York City. Um, and this is, this is basically what we want to do more of. How can we actually harvest some of these skills and give these guys more of a platform and avenue to talk about 
um, some of the lessons that they learned and get this into the hands of entrepreneurs who are maybe on the, on the other side of the law in the formal economy. And I think part of this question is a question of access. I recently just did this bus trip where I was traveling around the US and um, in every community that I went to, you have like amazing spaces like this, these like tech incubator spaces that have tons of resources and rock climbing walls and great foods. And I saw that you were eating a coconut, which is awesome. And then on the other side of town, you have people who, you know, are basically just street hustlers who don't have any of these resources, but who have all the skills of entrepreneurship. And how do we bridge these worlds together? So that's part of my mission moving forward is that the book isn't just a book in itself, but it's an invitation for people from these different communities to find ways of, of plugging in and creating bridges um, across one another. And then another thing that's evolved is some really interventionist artistic projects where I've been inspired by some of the misfits that I've interviewed and I've tried to activate this in my own work. So I used to write a lot of poetry and um, maybe, you know, no one really read this poetry. My parents didn't even read it. So I maybe had like five people that would read this poetry. And so there's so many poets out there where this is also an issue. You have uh, this amazing language and yet there's no real mainstream audience for it. So we developed this, this fun thing called Porn and Poetry where we basically worked with hackers to hack porn sites so that um, with poems. So as you're like watching a particular video, you'll suddenly get this like crazy pop-up that's not like your usual porn pop-up. Um, that's a beautiful poem by one, of, by one of the poets that we've curated it from. So that, that project is, is going strong and has been really fun. And uh, that brings me to Alter Egos. Another, another artistic project that I've been exploring is a character called the Amish Futurist. And there's a lot of good heritage. Um, we were making fun of Bowie a little bit earlier, but there's a lot of good uh, folks that have experimented with alter egos themselves. And my version of this was this Amish lady. So I started wearing um, Amish clothes and a bonnet and going around to tech conferences and um, startup places and basically just asking people very Socratic and existential questions, trying to get into the bigger meaning of what they were doing. So for me, one of my prime frustrations is not really understanding the bigger role that the technologies that people are creating have on our subjective lives. Like how is this changing? How is the technology that you're making changing my experience of intimacy or well-being in the world. And so these were some of the conversations that I was able to have as Rebecca, which is what I call her, because she's very sweet and she doesn't ask things in a, um, she asks things in a very vulnerable way and from an ignorant place, obviously, because she hasn't experienced a lot of technology. And so that's been a really fun way of really provoking that scene and asking hard questions. And it also in part comes from, you know, a real love of Amish people. I've spent time in Amish country um, I have an Amish newspaper here with me, actually, if anyone wants to see. It's very funny because they advertise for phones, but they advertise for plain phones in the newspaper. So it's like as simple as possible where you can't get apps and you can't text message and you can only have like credit phone systems. And in many of these Amish communities, Kevin Kelly has written about this extensively, that you, you really have slow adoption of technology. So it's not complete tech abstinence, but you're really looking at ways in which um, you have these beta testers. So people within the Amish community will test a particular technology before it's rolled out for the entire community to use. And that's to make sure that the community understands the effect of that technology. And so I've gone around and talked in my Amish persona about the power of buttermilk. And part of the, part of the power of buttermilk is the power of tradition and that we don't always need to be innovating, um, but that some things are really good like buttermilk and they should stay the same. Um, and, and also really combating this idea of the lone ranger type of entrepreneur in favor of more collaborative entrepreneurship, which you see more in Luddite communities and, and Amish communities. And for me personally, the alter ego gave me the ability to really deconstruct my own personality. It was, it was like LARP in some ways. It was very therapeutic. Um, suddenly I could be in a very vulnerable, uh, more feminine and very sensitive element of, and suddenly get access to a version of myself that I didn't have before. So I think with, 
with alter egos, we all can actually tap into this greater elasticity that we have. You know, there's so many different personalities that we have inside of us, and maybe we've come to live out one version or one kind of script of who we are that's that's really placed to our strengths. But I think part of the joy of living is is to get to experience as many different you know versions of yourself as possible. At least that's where I get a lot of pleasure from. And from this, I want to share a little bit more, lastly, just about this, this interest of prophecy. Um, certainly, there are a lot of misfits who take part in various prophetic traditions. I used to study 17th century astrologers who were being kicked out of the scientific establishment and were always predicting that the end of the world was going to come. And then I also am very active in following the hashtag prepper. Um, where you just see all these amazing different people who think that the world is going to end and there's a huge market for like prepper goods um, and in case this is going to happen. One of my favorite uh, prepper personas is, is this woman survivor, Jane, and she basically works on, um, after the apocalypse happens, she makes sure that uh, people have access to makeup. So like how do you forage for cosmetics and how do you look pretty after the apocalypse happens? So there are all these like weird personalities within this scene. Um, and for me, this, this asks this question of, well, how, are, how is spirituality, how is apocalypse, how, is, how are our prophetic ideals and religious beliefs changing as a result of the digital? Like, if we take this wiki, a f wiki kind of concept or peer-to-peer -peer concept and apply it to religion, like, what does this look like? How does, like, greater decentralization um, and access to information affect our spiritual beliefs? So one of the things that um, I started looking at was this idea of the mashup, where increasingly people are taking you know, a little bit of Buddhism or a little bit from the Torah, and they're, they're mashing it up into their own you know, spiritual uh, system. And, and increasingly, it's becoming individual, but it's also um, there's an ability to access this information like never before. And the result of this was a group I put together called Wisdom Hackers where we each explored one burning question that we were holding. So one person looked at, for example, um, festival spirit. He spent a whole summer going to various music festivals across Europe and asking, how do we keep festival spirit alive in everyday life? I looked, my wisdom hacker question was really around the nature of identity, which was um, partially my preoccupation with alter egos. And this became a community for us to, to hold these questions, where in the busyness of modern life, I think we don't often get to explore deep um, things that we're actually holding. And so how do we give ourselves not just permission, but also build accountability with peers to do some of that investigation? So that was something that we ran. We had 15 people initially who each explored a question. And then we've held global salons around the world. Um, and this group next is putting on something that we're calling the incubator for the next messiah. Um, and this is basically American Idol for gurus. Um, the whole idea is how do we apply the logic of startup incubation to the guru industry? So we're going to work with a major VC backer in San Francisco, and I'm going there next week to begin scouting people, um, and basically have them kick this off by, by launching this fake press release where we get them to basically talk about their boredom in investing merely in startups and say how they want to really invest in the next guru. Um, and then we, we have a whole source and selection process for doing that. Um, and we'll get 15 aspiring gurus to go through this process. And, and this can be, this is interesting because it plays to different markets in different ways. It can be more of a pure play reality uh, program, but then we also hope to em embed more of a satirical um, uh, group within it to actually film more of the funny bits that happen and not for it to be so straight, but for it, it to actually be a bit satire, uh, more of a satire. And so that plays uh, to very, to a mainstream audience, but then also to more of a snarky audience that we can sort of cultivate online and do more uh, guerrilla and like transmedia engagement with. Great. So that's, that's all I wanted to share. Thank you guys so much for listening. And I think we have a, a little bit of time for Q&A. Great, so any questions? Any alter ego ideas that people are thinking about? So I'll pop up here first. Uh, first, let's give a round of applause to Alexa. Thanks so much for that. And uh, this is something we were kind of discussing as we were walking around the office, but I think it's, I think it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, 
how do you kind of go about sourcing these people and meeting them and then like securing interviews with them? I mean, you're talking to gang members and pirates and hackers who people generally don't want to be found. How, can you just talk about that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so there's no like LinkedIn for the black market economy, which would have been really easy. Um, there is a fixer industry that I didn't realize until after writing the book. So there are people that can connect you with, you know, leading gangsters or Somali pirates. Um, I, you know, wasn't a journalist by trade, so I didn't know that existed, but we really just, asked everyone we knew. So we went to different, you know, when I showed up in India, for example, we were trying to find someone who could sell us drugs initially and, um, you know, just take every avenue that we could to, to find these guys. Um, we got in touch with the guy from the Latin Kings through the Occupy movement, um, but it was really just, you know, th there wasn't like a rigorous ability to be like, this is who we, exactly who we want to speak to. And it was more just, you know, who we encountered, but we found some amazing, incredible, um, folks, and I think they, you know, the book is really, you go from sort of starting with an Amish camel milk farmer to going to uh, Somali pirates and then King Tone, and you begin to see some of the similarities that are animating these very different types of personalities. So, yeah, it was definitely hard and took like <laughs> three years, and I'm still getting introduced to people now who I'm writing about. Cool. During that process of encountering all these people, how often did you feel threatened or scared or possibly get arrested or harassed by non-misfit economy people? Yeah, um, so I never really felt like physically threatened or frightened. Um, there was one, if you saw the video, I was on the back of that motorcycle. That was the worst experience. Um, that was a gangster who was a, a sort of third generation like mafia guy associated with Dawood Ibrahim's gang in India, uh, which is notorious. And he was a little bit fucked up that evening and decided um, to perform for a filmmaker who was like, yeah, great shot, like get on the bike and um, was just like doing wheelies. And so I felt like I almost uh, died then. Um, but yeah, let's, I, I really, you know, there weren't any moments where, you know, we really felt threatened. So it seems like a big part of the concept of the misfit economy is to question a lot of the rules that are put forth. And one of the things you did is you had a lot of people who are in essence criminals who are breaking those rules for reasons that help them business-wise, but then you're connecting them with startups. But then you also talk about the more spiritual side of thinking through uh, the process of maybe not necessarily breaking those rules, but what that is. So how are you dealing, I guess, with that balance? Because it seems to me that you have a more a big moral issue of telling people, which you see a lot, I think, in startups and in big businesses, yeah. is they will break rules that they should not be breaking, yeah. and and vice versa. You know, so other rules that some companies do that they break that ends up making them big. Yeah. So how do you kind of balance that, I guess, in this concept? Yeah, I think it's I think it's definitely a challenge, um, and I think the first thing that we tried to overcome was this idea that we can't just see the world in good and evil terms. Um, particularly, I think having more empathy for the black market innovators because a lot of these guys were born into poverty, and uh, this activity provided a way of actually, um, you know, of of growing economically. Uh, so maybe I have more sort of patience and tolerance for people that are breaking the rules in that sense because they're coming from environments of constraint versus a company like Uber, whose success you know really owes to the fact that they are breaking a lot of rules and like having regulation, you know, uh, lag behind a lot of that. Um, so that I, I guess I have less empathy for, but I think, I think particularly coming from my experience of working with entrepreneurs within the corporate sector, they were breaking rules all the time and they weren't like big regulatory rules, but there's so many rules and protocols that we have within massive organizations and the nature of bureaucracies that really stifle innovation. So for that, for that subgroup of people, um, rule breaking or breaking protocol became an important part of their own survival and a way of getting these very you know, disruptive, often social and environmentally driven propositions into the company. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't say there's like one blanket answer on that, but um, yeah, it's definitely a good question. And I think the, the whole spirit of it is how do we bring greater informality into the economy generally, because we've seen the ways in which industrial economy is, is essentially expired, these command and control systems. We can't really afford to live in them for a variety of reasons. Um, and so how do we actually become better at, at improvising and creating some of these new types of systems that we see more on the fringe? 
In a lot of your slides and what you've been discussing, it seems like a gendered issue where a lot of the people who you're talking to were male. Yeah. Um, do you think that's attributed to like similar situations where it's just the patriarchy overall? Do you think it's some kind of other kind of system that's involved there? And how are women involved in this situation and this misfit economy? Yeah, I think it's really interesting because we tried to find a lot of female protagonists, but even within, you know, they're Latin queens in addition to the Latin kings. Um, but a lot of the criminals, particularly the ones who were, um, you know, able to take the most risk and also able to speak to us because of the nature of their egos that, like, you know, weren't really threatened by us, um, they ended up being men. Um, and I think in, in many ways, this sort of personality, when we had our, our launch party, for example, and these drug kingpins were there, they, there was something really fatalistic um, in their thinking. Like they knew they would get caught, they knew this wouldn't last forever. And um, you know, they were basically chasing um, some of them like women and money for, for in a lot of ways. And I do, I do think like since we've encountered a lot of case studies of like caught entrepreneurs that are women. So within Somali pirates, piracy for example, it's not that women are becoming pirates, but they're actually um, supplying a lot of the narcotic that the pirates are becoming dependent on. And so that's less risk in a lot of ways. Um, and they can manage that domestically while being embedded locally in community. Um, yeah, even, I mean, even when I stayed with an Amish family, it was, there was one particular woman who was serving us all dinner and then didn't even sit down with us. And so you saw ways in which there was kind of a patriarchal culture that was forming. But then after that, um, we all went downstairs and she just destroyed everyone in ping pong. Like she just was like totally wicked and like serving and spiking. And for me, it was beautiful, but there was also this sort of moment of sadness because I realized suddenly she had all this energy within her and all this drive and force and fierceness that she didn't really have an outlet in the world for. Um, so I think it's a great question and it's something I'm continually exploring, but I, I wouldn't say there's one narrative that I've really um, been able to pull out where I can just say, oh, black markets equal patriarchy. Um, but yeah, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of issues there for sure. So I guess a lot of the alternative um, communities are sort of antagonistic to each other. And I'm kind of interested in what happens where these communities, economies rub up against each other. In the sense that the, the people that you're talking to are unusual, maybe, in those. Th and so you're sort of talking to the misfits of the misfits, in yep. a way. How do their lives sort of play out after they've decided that, that they want to sort of take on that role? Do they, you know, end up just sort of going back to the way they were? Do they, do they make a choice? Do they cross over? What kind of stuff? Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. I think, um, yeah, first of all, we didn't just try and profile um, sort of status quo individuals within the black market economy. So even within, um, you know, King Tone, who ran the Latin Kings, we were trying to find someone who was trying to change that culture. And all of the misfits that we profile were, were people that were born into certain cultures and were actively trying to change them from within. So I think that's something they definitely all share. Um, and your, your other question was about what happens after they sort of embrace this identity. Well, I think it's hard. I think, and this is the challenge of, you know, one of the, the end of the book is like, what happens when we all embrace our inner misfits? And I think the more sort of authentic you feel you are, um, the more pushback you can often get from the cultures or the institutions that are hosting you. So it is often a balance of like how there's a trade-off you know, between individuality and authenticity on the one hand, and the degree of conformity that we need to fit into different institutions or, you know, tone failed ultimately in transforming the kings because of the external pushback and the internal pushback. Um, and a lot of the entrepreneurs that we profiled ultimately, you know, had to jump ship because they realized these cultures weren't actually fostering the type of environment they needed to bring these innovations to life. So I think it's a really hard balance of, you know, for those that can try and, you know, leave the cultures they're from, that's sometimes the avenue for that. Uh, but in other cases, you, you just need enormous resilience because you are going against the dominant culture and grain of, of you know, the, the systems that you're a part of. And that's exhausting. 
Um, and I think both of my parents did that in very different ways growing up. So it's, it's a sort of battle that I'm used to. And it's why I have appreciation for it. But yeah, if you're doing things that aren't normalized in the world, where people don't really understand where you're coming from, or you're asking questions that feel like you know they're they're very alien to people, that can be you know very threatening for people. And so one of the things we look at is how these groups need entourages, um, need these support networks. Whether or not you know you're a gangster trying to transform within the gang, or you're someone within a corporation trying to do that, or you know even this book project like owes to like 20 of my closest friends who were like always there and able to 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 support me. So I think for anyone doing anything that's a bit offbeat or unusual, having that that core group of support, people that can normalize your reality for you is really important as you're trying to unplug from the dominant reality. Cool. <laughs> Did I get a present? All right, yeah. Thanks again so yeah. much, Alexa, for coming and talking. Thank you.